Hi, I'm Roger Copeland, pastor of Northern Hills Baptist Church. Who is Northern Hills Baptist Church? We are you. We are everyday people who love our families, who are seeking direction in life. We are teachers, doctors, bankers. We are your next door neighbor. We want you to be a part of these exciting times at Northern Hills Baptist Church. Take God's Word this morning and open it to the book of Proverbs chapter 31. The book of Proverbs chapter 31. And in a moment we'll begin reading at verse number 10. What a wonderful day to be in the Lord's house. To worship the living Savior. And to know that He loves us. He really loves us. I hope that today you are grateful for God's love. What do you think of when I use the word mother? Well, some second graders were asked that question. What does mother mean? One of the questions was this. What ingredients are mothers made of? And a second grade boy said, Mothers are made out of clouds and angel hair and everything nice in the world and one dab of meanness. Another question was, why did God give you your mother and not some other mom? He said, because God knew she would like me a lot more than other people's moms would like me. What kind of a little girl was your mom? I don't know because I wasn't there, but my guess would be pretty bossy. But they say she used to be nice. Well, you'll love this one. What is the difference between moms and dads? Moms work at work and work at home. And dads just go to work at work. <laughs> what, it, what would it take to make your mom perfect? On the inside, she's already perfect. On the outside, some plastic surgery. <laughs> if you could change one thing, if you could change one thing about your mom, what would it be? Well, I would like, to get rid of those invisible eyes in the back of her head. Today I want us to see what God thinks about moms. The wisest man who ever lived, a king by the name of Solomon, um, gives us an entire chapter about a godly mom, what she looks like, how she speaks, what she does with her time and with her life. It has been said that the father is the head of the home. The children are the hub of the home. And I would say this morning that if the father is the head of the home, the children are the hub of the home, it is the mother who is the heart of the home. When you come to Proverbs 31, this is the longest chapter concerning any family member. You cannot go anywhere in all of the Bible and find a detailed description of a father. You cannot go anywhere in the Bible and find such a detailed description of children. But when it comes to mothers, we have this extended passage of Scripture about moms. One of the beautiful things about this passage is that it is in acrostic form. That means that each verse begins with a succeeding letter of the Hebrew alphabet. In other words, he goes from A to Z to describe for us what a godly mom looks like. I'm going to summarize this chapter under three headings. And the first thing that I want you to know this morning is that the wife, the mother, must have godly character. Character is everything. Character is not what people think about you. Character is not the opinion that people have about you. Character is what you ultimately are. Keep in mind that, that this describes the ideal mother. And I think sometimes uh, women look at this passage and they say, I can never do that. This is the idea. This is the goal. This is what you are shooting for. This should be the desire of your heart that you would be this Proverbs 31 mother. Notice how it begins at verse 10. Who can find a virtuous woman? That's an interesting word, a virtuous woman. He does not say who can find a successful woman. He does not say who can find a beautiful woman. 
But who can find a virtuous woman? The idea of this word is a woman of moral strength. He's speaking about her character. He's speaking about spiritual strength. Who can find a woman who has godly character, who is spiritually alive and vibrant and strong? Who can find a woman like that? And he says that her price is far above rubies. Here is a priceless woman. Here is a woman of virtue, of character, of godliness. And Solomon says that her price is far above rubies. He's not saying that she's for sale. He's not saying that you can buy a virtuous woman. He's telling us rather the worth of a virtuous woman. The things that he says uh, about the godly woman are things that last. Let me just challenge you to think this morning, what about you will last forever? Your house won't, your car won't. What about you will live on after the Lord calls you home? What about you? What about your legacy that you, that you will leave your children? I can tell you it is not going to be money that matters it is not going to be a position in life that matters. What ultimately matters most is that you leave your children a godly legacy. And you've got to start now, today, to build that godly legacy. Look what he says in verse 11 about her. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. Any married couple that has ever been betrayed by their spouse will tell you that when trust is gone, love is gone. If there is no trust, there will be no love. Now in this context, he's talking about trust in the sense of what she does with the family's money. The framing of marriage is love, but the foundation of marriage is is trust. This virtuous woman is a woman whose character is such that she can be trusted. Again, he's talking about managing money because he says in the second part of the verse that she shall have no need of spoil. What is the mark of a good wife and a good mother? Look at it in verse 12. She will do her husband good and not evil. All the days of her life. You see, a good mother, a good wife is good to her husband and good for her husband. This virtuous woman is a woman who is like a fountain that never runs dry. She always does her husband good. She's a great encouragement to her husband. She's the number one cheerleader in the home. She never speaks evil of her husband. She never defames his character. She is a woman of highest ideals and moral integrity and spiritual fortitude. That is a virtuous woman. She has godly character. I've said to you before, but I'll say it again. I never heard my mom and dad have a disagreement. I know they had them. I just never heard them. I never heard my dad speak a disparaging word about my mom, ever. I never heard my mom say anything in the slightest negative way about my dad. You say, well, they must have really loved each other. I'm going to tell you, it starts way before love. It starts with character. When two people of character get married, this is the result. She, her husband, trusts her. She does not defame him. Where does that all begin? It doesn't begin because they spy each other across a crowded room and it is love at first sight. It begins in the heart. It begins with a woman who has godly character. It begins with a man who has godly character. That is her character. But let me, let me show you the second thing, second thing, and that is her competence. 
She, she is competent. She knows how to run a household. She knows how to rear children. Look what the Bible says in verse 13. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. Everybody needs to be clothed and they need to be clothed well. And I'm not talking about designer clothes. And I'm not talking about having a horse sewn on a shirt. I'm talking about uh, here is a woman who cares about her family to the degree that she will work day and night to provide for them. Uh, wool was for the winter. Flax was for the summer. So whatever the season might have been, here is a woman that is providing for her family. But notice, notice how he qualifies that in verse 13. And worketh willingly with her hands. That's interesting to me. She works willingly. That means that it is not out of necessity. That means that it is not a out of duty. But the word willingly means delightfully. How does a woman of Christian character serve her family? Delightfully. Oh, another day, these messy kids, these mean kids, they're just like their daddy. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's another day of drudgery. No, when you have godly character, serving your family is not drudgery. It is something that you do willingly and delightfully. Look what he says in verses 14 and 15. She is like the merchant ships. She bringeth forth her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and gives meat to the household and a portion to her maidens. This is a woman that goes the second mile. She finds the best bargain. She finds the best food. Her concern is the well-being of her family. She gets up early in the morning. She stays up late at night. All in the interest of the needs of her household. This mom is a launderer. She is a seamstress. She is a cook. She is a doctor. She is all of that rolled into one. Now we find something else interesting about this woman. In verse 16, she considers a field and buys it with the fruit of her hands. She plants a vineyard. She works outside the home. She helps bring income to the home. Uh, by the way, if you're married to a woman who works both outside the home and in the home, cut her some slack. It's a good place for an amen right there. I didn't expect it, but anyway. <laughs> Cut her some slack. Be thankful for her. Be patient with her. And don't be so demanding. Men, if your wife works outside the home, that means you work also inside the home. If she's outside, you've got to help on the inside. I heard about a working mother. She was doing the best that she could. Uh, to be the best wife and mother she could be. She was trying to be a good employee. And, and to be successful at work. Uh, but but her, her husband was always complaining. He was always finding fault. He was never satisfied. And he got up one morning and said to his wife. Said can't you fix me a hot breakfast this morning? She went to the drawer and pulled out a match. And he said, what's this for? She said, if you want a hot meal, set your cornflakes on fire. <laughs> well, what I'm saying to you is that here is a woman that worked outside the home. She was industrious. She worked. She labored. She was an investor. She bought a field. She planted a vineyard. This is a woman who is doing all of that while she is caring for her family. Look at verse 17. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goes out uh, not by night. She knows how to stretch a dollar. She looks for the best buy, not necessarily the best bargain. And they're not synonymous. Verse 19 says that she layeth her hands to the spindle and her hands hold the distaff. Obviously when she sits down, she's not idle. She sits down but she is working. She is working with her hands as she sits. She has a practical knowledge of how to do things. 
She has a practical knowledge of how to make a household work. She is a homemaker. She is the glue that is holding the family together. She's working hard. And by the way, everybody ought to have a good work ethic. Whether you're a male or a female, it is, there is the Bible doctrine of work. And it says that every Christian ought to have a sound, solid work ethic. And I would remind you that work came into being before sin entered into the world. Work is not the result of sin. Before Adam and Eve sinned, they were told to work, to gather the food. Here's something interesting about this woman. You see, her husband is successful. Look at it in verse 23. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. The gates of that day was where city business was transacted. We might say that he's going to the office. He's going to the city gates. There's the office. There's where business is conducted. And her husband is known there. You know why he's successful? His wife has contributed to his success. Now let's suppose this morning that she's jealous of her husband. She's jealous of his success. Now here is a woman of godly character, a virtuous woman who is not jealous of her husband's success. She contributes to the success of her husband. The Bible says in verse 27 that she looks over the affairs of her house day and night and eateth not the bread of idleness. Of course, this woman needs to sleep, but she works day and night. You can go online, I did it this morning, and find out, by the way, fellas, if your wife works outside the home and inside the home and she's a good wife and a good mother, you you got to steal, I'm just telling you. But you can go online and uh, to salary.com and every year they compute. I did it this morning. Every year they compute what the annual salary of a mother would be. They take into account all of these different things that she does. And on this particular one, uh, they, they, they uh, considered her a nurse, a homemaker, a chef, a janitor, an accountant, a teacher, a chauffeur who is available 24-7. Do you know what she would make? Now get your checkbook out and get ready to write, write your wife a check. $178,201. If she were being paid based on what she does, then that would be her salary. Go ahead and write the check. Never take these women for granted. And, and I think this is one of, the, one of the greatest complaints that many mothers and wives have. It's, it's not the work that is involved. It is not the tireless, countless hours that are involved. Most wives and mothers love their families enough that they're willing to do that. But what wears on them and breaks them down is that feeling of not being appreciated. Maybe you haven't told your wife lately. That you appreciate all that she does for the home. She buys the groceries, cooks the meals, cleans the house, get the kids from point A to point B, and she picks up after you. You ought to say thank you every once in a while. I heard about a man came home one day and the house was just in a mess. That was unusual. Uh, the, it was a disaster. The baby was crying. Dirty dishes were everywhere. And, and uh, the TV was blaring. And, and the beds were unmade. And the carpets were unvacuumed. And, and dinner was uncooked. And he said to his wife, he said, What in the world has happened? And she said, You know those days when you come in and ask me what I've done today? I didn't do it today. But there's a final thing I want you to see, the character of a godly woman. Her character. The character of a godly woman. Let me say this about character. The development of godly character always begins with Jesus. The development of godly character is not learned through some self-help 
uh, manual that you read or a class that you attend, godly character always begins with Jesus. And you know what? The more you love Jesus and the more you pursue Jesus, the godlier your character will become. All of the business in the world does not develop character. Character comes from a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But there's a third thing I want you to see. That is her contribution to the home. What does she contribute to the home? You see, the, re the reality is that, that when a mom is happy, everyone can be happy. I know you've heard the statement, when mom ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. But when mom is happy, then everybody in the home can be happy. Look what he says in verse 26. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. You see, the mom sets the atmosphere in the home. The mother's voice can either make the home a place of joy and delight, or the mother's voice and her tone can make it a battlefield. Probably every mother at some time or the other raises their voice more than they should. And you're not getting a word of condemnation from me on that, okay? But I can tell you this, that it's important not only what you say, it is equally important how you say it. Look, look what the Bible says. She opens her mouth with wisdom and in her tongue is the law of kindness. You put those two together, wisdom and kindness, and what it means is that she speaks kind words. Not that she won't call you out. It's not that she's going to let things slide. But rather, even in a rebuke, she can do it in a kind way. Here's what a godly mother does. She speaks words of wisdom, but she does it with kindness. You see, the mom is a master teacher. Some of the greatest lessons that we've learned in life, we learn from our mothers. Wouldn't you agree with that? Our moms taught us valuable lessons. I read an article uh, that was titled, Things That Only a Mom Can Teach. And the first one was this. Only a mom can teach you about anticip anticipation. Just wait till we get home. <laughs> Only a mom can teach you about receiving. You're going to get it when we get home. Only a mom can teach you about logic. If you fall out of that tree and break your neck, you're not going to town with me. Only a mom can teach you about physiology. If that lawnmower cuts off your uh, toes, don't come running to me. Only a mom can teach us about genetics. You're just like your dad. And here's my favorite. Only a mom can teach us about justice. One of these days you're going to have kids and I hope they turn out just like you. <laughs> then you'll understand. So here's a woman that speaks. Uh, uh, but, but she's not just speaking uh, in order to speak. She's speaking words of wisdom. She's communicating truth. She's teaching her kids uh, when they get up in the morning, when they go be to bed at night. She's teaching her kids uh, by the wayside. Every experience in life, she seizes on it as an opportunity to communicate divine truth to her children. And she does all of that with kindness. Look what he says in verse 28. Her children arise up and call her blessed. Her children also, and he praises her. Now the idea of this word, rise up and call her blessed, is that it is something that is done on a regular basis. It is not a one-time event. It is not a once-a-year event, but continuously. As a way of life, her children rise up and spontaneously call her blessed. Uh, let's keep this in its historical context. Her children rise up and call her blessed. They didn't have Mother's Day in Israel. So you know he's not talking about on Mother's Day, rise up and call your mother blessed. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about in the daily living of life. Rise up 
and call your mother blessed. Let it be a way of life. Let it be a pattern of life. Not only does he say that, that this is what the children do, but her, her husband praises her. You see, there's a debt that all of us owe to our moms that we can never repay. If we had 10,000 lifetimes, we could never repay the debt we owe to our mothers, but we can make installments on that debt by rising up and calling her blessed. Did you know what? Your mom needs that affirmation. She needs that acclamation, that admiration. Uh, she needs that. She needs to hear it come from you. And then in verse 30, notice what he says. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Now her husband's praising her. So who is it here that is praising her? It's the Lord himself. Her husband praises her, her children praise her, and the day will come when the Lord Himself will praise her. Nobody in the world leaves behind a greater legacy than a virtuous woman who strives to be a godly wife and a godly mother. There's not a more powerful force on the planet than the life of a godly mother who is sold out for the cause of Jesus Christ, who is committed to her husband, devoted to her children, dedicated to her home. Solomon reminds us that charm is deceitful. Because what a woman may be on the outside may not be what she is on the inside. Beauty is vain. It passes. It fades. And by the way, it doesn't make any difference who you are. This is a true statement. Beauty fades. So I don't know if I'm okay with that. It doesn't matter. It's going to happen anyway. Beauty fades. The Word of God says that it does. Beauty fades. But godliness and graciousness are lights that never go out. They are an aroma that never lose their fragrance. The next time you pick up a bottle of Heinz 57 ketchup, I want you to remember this. The founder, Henry J. Heinz, died. And they came to the reading of the will, and this is what he said. Looking forward to the time when my earthly career will end, our desire to set forth at the very beginning of this will is the most important item in it. A confession of my faith. In Jesus Christ as my Lord. I also desire to bear witness to the fact that throughout my life. In which there has been unusual joys and sorrows. I have been wonderfully sustained by my faith. And then he said. This legacy was left me by my consecrated mother. A woman of strong faith. And to it I attribute any success that I have obtained. Mom, I'm telling you, you have the power to rock this world with a generation of young people who will be champions for Christ. If this nation is ever turned back to God, it won't be the preachers that do it. It won't be the men that do it. It will be the mothers who pour godliness into their children, who model godliness before their children day in and day out. It's tall order. It's high. How are you going to do it? Well, it all starts with Jesus. I'll tell you unashamedly this morning that a saved mother can be a mother that a lost mother can never be because Jesus makes that kind of difference in a life. If you don't know the